Thanks for joining us. My name is Nancy Furness, and this is We've Got Issues. We've Got Issues is a nonpartisan, citizens-based forum where we look at topics of concern to the Tri-Cities. And I would like to thank Tri-Cities Community Television for helping us to make these interviews possible. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that today's interview is taking place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of Coquitlam First Nations. We thank the Coquitlam people who continue to live on the lands and to protect the lands and the waters and all that lies above and below. So this afternoon, we're joined by Mathila Karnick, who is running for Port Coquitlam City Council. So thank you so much for coming in today, Mathila. Thank I'm looking you, forward to learning more about you. Thank you for having me here today, Nancy. Well, I was wondering if we could maybe just start by getting to know you a little bit better. Tell us um, about yourself and, and what you think we, we need to know about you. Of course. Um, I, I came to Canada in 2016 with my husband and we, we lived in Vancouver for a couple of years uh, before we moved um, to, we decided to buy our first home. Mm -hmm. And uh, Port Coquitlam stood out in, among the many, many places that we visited um, on an immigrant's budget, of course. But what also stood out to us was SD43, the school district, simply because our intention was to start a family and we wanted to be in a good school district. And when we walked around Port Coquitlam, um, the downtown core, the fact that there was a toddler park and a dog park within walking distance kind of sealed the deal for us. And I've been a Port Coquitlam resident since. Right. So it sounds like you found Port Coquitlam to be a very welcoming space when you first came. Um, what sort of inspired you to run for city council? Um, just to, um, you know, to kind of draw back a little bit on what my uh, professional experience has mm -hmm. been so far. Um, when, uh, uh, prior to arriving in Canada, I worked um, in the entertainment industry. Okay. I, I was an artist manager um, in Bollywood, uh, which meant that I worked with a whole different um, kind of system. Mm -hmm. which was not so much of a system at that point in time. It's changed a lot. It's, um, it's more process driven now, okay. but uh, it taught me a lot, of, a lot of things about myself, which, were, uh, which inherently are my abilities to connect with people on a very, very basic level right. and um, to uh, do good work out of good conversations with people. And that has pretty much been my essence Mm -hmm. um, throughout. So when, when I came to Canada and I found myself um, job hunting, right. as um, any new immigrant um, does, and trying to find that connect between um, what I could do for a living and what my core skill set was, I found myself drawing strength from, my, uh, from these very abilities, my abilities to connect with people and um, to do work that puts me in the thick of being around people all the time. Um, in terms of my motivation uh, for running for city council, that is at the heart of it. Um, the biggest push that I needed was to find stronger connections mm -hmm. among people, to be able to give my community a voice and a voice that is very representative of the changing demographic and the changing dynamic that we are witnessing in Port Coquitlam. And I have seen it in just the past few years that I've been here. So I want to be able to have people connect to the leadership, the local governance right. that is here in the city, and possibly find somebody who looks like them, who speaks like them, and who maybe has the same background that they do. Right. No, so it sounds like you're bringing some inclusivity um, and you're bringing a new voice to city council and a new perspective. What have you been doing so far in preparation for the election? Uh, when I decided um, that, yes, I am going ahead with this, mm -hmm. it came from months and months of meeting new people within the community. I am, I am somebody uh, who is... Uh, who is at her best conversing with people. So if you find me at the dog park or at um, the toddler park with my daughter or my dog, um, 
I will be talking to people and I, I have no qualms against walking up to somebody and introducing myself and asking them where they are. Most importantly, what I've been doing is listening. Mm -hmm. um, I delivered a baby during the pandemic. My daughter is two years oh, old now. Wow. Okay. So I have dealt with isolation. Right. I have dealt with a whole different aspect of myself that needed to go out there, but there was no opportunity to do that. So I then introspected and I found other ways to connect with um, new moms, um, you know, created a WhatsApp group, went out on Facebook, um, did a lot of Zoom calls mm -hmm. um, with families and friends and, you know, tried my best to do those socially distant walks with other mothers right. in the neighborhood. And that I found helped. Mm -hmm. So what what I what I'm bringing to um, the council and my training of sorts is just these very different conversations with people from different backgrounds and different skill sets and different family setups even um, to shape what the next few years could look like for Port Coquitlam because that's that's my vision um, for the city is to draw on the strength of its different people. And right. that could go towards making it more resilient. Um, I, I think I like how you've sort of framed that so that during the time that uh, we were dealing with COVID, you used that as a time for some self-reflection and looking for other ways to connect. Yeah. So it didn't stop you from connecting, but you had to find other ways to connect. When you've connected with people, when you've been out in the community, what are you hearing when you talk to people? What are their issues? What are their concerns? Um, in terms of concerns, it's more to do with access to certain kinds of information. Mm -hmm. Now, primarily, I've been, and I blame my type A personality for that, I, I find things out. So if there's an activity, for instance, or if there's, um, if there's something that I want to fill up my time doing, I will actively look out for it. But okay. I, I, I understand that not everybody um, does that and it's not something that could come easily for some people. Mm -hmm. So if I'm talking to a new mother, for instance, and I say, hey, there's this uh, dance class that my two-year-old daughter goes for at the recreation center, and she will go, oh, really? There is a dance class for two-year-olds? So I, I feel there is a lot that happens within the community that is not um, easily accessible to a certain um, kind of people, I want to say, um, to a certain uh, background of people. So I want information, especially when it comes to bringing people together from all, um, form of, from all backgrounds of life together. So I want to bridge that disconnect that is evident in my conversations with people from different backgrounds when it comes to um, knowing more about facilities, when it comes to knowing more about the city, when it comes to understanding that um, there is only a certain kind of activity available as opposed to something that they are more comfortable doing culturally. I, I just want to ensure that if there are different kinds of people in the community, we're all giving them an equal communal space okay. to come together and kind of be. You've brought up a number of different issues there, so I, I yeah. have a couple of, of questions for you yeah. that comes out of that. First of all, um, whose voices aren't being heard? Like, who are these people that aren't um, sort of connecting with the city? And then if you're successful in getting on to city council, how will you address that? How will you make sure that those people are both connected with the city and that their voices are heard? Mm -hmm. um, the top three, um, I want to say, kinds of people who would really benefit from knowing more about what the city can do for them are new mothers, uh, families that have um, young kids, especially those belonging to diverse backgrounds, mm -hmm. um, simply because if they are, and new families as well, simply because if they are coming to a new environment, there is a lot of adjustment right. that the young ones need to do. And that responsibility inevitably falls on the parents because they have to then fill up their time and conversations don't happen easily in certain diverse backgrounds. So to make that 
easy for certain um, populations is what my aim is going to be. I feel that the city would benefit greatly from having a peer-to-peer -peer system with experienced families belonging to diverse backgrounds coming together to coach newer families, to have that access point when it comes to, hey, how do we navigate the school system here? Right. How do we navigate the daycare system here? What is the uh, affordable childcare benefit? And these might be, um, this might be information that comes easily to others who have lived here longer, who have smoothened out that aspect of navigating the environment. Uh, but these are very, very important things for newer families and younger families to know and understand. Right. So that is very important to me. Well, and as a newer family in the community, yeah. um, a new mother, relatively new, um, and as an immigrant, you um, bring all those new perspectives, right? Yeah. So you're maybe speaking for, um, I'm just trying to think of current council. Yeah. I don't see that voice on current council. Yes. Um, so I guess that brings us to kind of what are your priorities? If you get into city council, what mm -hmm. would be your, just very briefly, and we can talk about them more in, in detail, but what would be your top three priorities? So I feel um, city council is doing a fantastic job as far as infrastructure and cityscape and development is concerned. And um, I, am, uh, I am very grateful to where they have taken the city. I don't mean to, uh, you know, replace any of them. I want to fill in the gaps and right. my gaps stem from the micro level and that is the focus on community. So my top three are going to be um, developing a lot of peer-to-peer -peer programs, like I mentioned, for families, for young mothers, um, for just um, kids of diverse backgrounds mm -hmm. to engage with um, on city resources, um, affordability and how to navigate that because okay. that is a growing concern for um, not just new families, but also families that have called Poco home for uh, many years yes. now. It is, it is a growing concern and I want to um, do my bit in helping navigate that very delicate topic. Now I understand right. it stems from a lot of um, different provincial and federal kind of, it has a lot of layers to it. Yes. But I'd like to work actively to at least improve those um, um, uh, improve access to that information from a local government level. I also have my focus, so my final um, out of those top three is going to be working very, very hard to make the downtown core mm -hmm. a symbol of inclusivity and diversity and to help it retain the charm that it currently has in place and just build on it. Right. Because I feel um, there is space there that could be utilized in bringing together um, different parts of the community. Right, um, and I just want to circle back a little bit. That's, you've covered like quite a, a, a broad range. Um, I just want to circle back a little bit to talking about connecting families and making sure that they can access and are aware of the resources that are available in mm -hmm. the city. And you talked about peer-to-peer -peer counseling. Um, what would the city's role be? Like as a, a city councillor, what would your role be and what role do you see the city playing in uh, in sort of creating that whole this. scenario mm -hmm. and, and creating that kind mm -hmm. of um, system? I think we have um, a fantastic recreation center mm -hmm. that could be put to great use in um, having space made for these peer-to-peer -peer programs first off to take place. It would be great to um, look into the thick of the city in mm -hmm. terms of people from diverse backgrounds, make them ambassadors of not just their professions but also of their experience and have them come forward to work with um, these families, to act as mentors and guides to these new families coming in because I feel Familiarity is what would make this journey easier. Right. When you move to a new um, community, for instance, if you see a familiar face, and it doesn't have to be somebody that you know right away, but somebody that you know you can walk up to and ask questions without feeling intimidated because of language or color or anything on those lines, I think that would make um, people coming to the city feel more confident about being a part of the city. So there is a lot of potential to start um, kind of 
transforming the recreation center mm -hmm. into um, a symbol and a space for different backgrounds to come together um, and, uh, you know, help towards uh, breeding this community, right. communal sense as well. Okay, so it sounds like there's a big role for the community center to play yep. in bringing the community together. Yep. Uh, let's talk a little bit about affordability. Housing affordability, we know we're in a little bit of a crisis. Yes. It's not just Port Coquitlam, it's everywhere in the Lower Mainland. Yes. What can you do as a city councillor to start addressing housing affordability and to make sure that everybody you know, is included and has yes. access to a house? Absolutely. Um, I do want to say that I do need a little bit more experience and coaching in that um, area. Mm -hmm. And I want to draw upon the support of established council members when it comes to understanding how best to navigate this space. I know the city has done tremendously um, in extending support to families by uh, extending the deadline for property taxes and then mm -hmm. keeping it um, without increasing it during the pandemic. So these are small steps that go, um, you know, a long way in helping families. But we also need to take into account that if you if you want growing families, mm -hmm. they need more space to grow and to live within Poco as well. So if we are going down the route of housing and if we are bringing newer developers and again like i say i i need coaching from the city right. enable you know in order to understand this issue better but is there a, an element of affordable that we can discuss with developers in terms of planning and you know bringing more and more um, opportunities such as that um, you know if there's a new condo development for instance what can be done to help families within POCO access that space. Right. So I, I want to say there is, um, from my end, I do need a little bit more understanding of what goes into city planning measures. And I think yeah. there's nothing wrong yeah. with, um, you know, being open to learning and yeah. listening. So Absolutely. that's part of collaborating and working with council. It will be a learning experience for sure. Yeah. Are we asking enough, do you think, of developers right now? Is there more that we should be asking them to contribute when they're building and developing in our city? I would say there's always space for more, mm -hmm. simply because we aren't able to work with the issue right now, and the issue is affordability. Right. So if we don't see um, a solution, it just means that there's more to ask. And I think also you brought up the point that it's not just a municipal level decision that you would be needing to reach out and work with your provincial and Absolutely. federal counterparts. So you already do know something. Yeah. <laughs> um, one question that I wanted to ask around um, the development in the city, I think you have expressed some concerns about public safety. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about what those concerns are and what you would like to see happen to address them? Absolutely. And now I'm going to speak as somebody who has walked the streets of Poco up and down with my dog and with my baby in a stroller. Mm -hmm. So these are very basic concerns for me in terms of um, to give you a very uh, basic example. It's just um, cars parked on uh, double sides of the streets, not following uh, bylaw rules where, you know, there's a fire hydrant or a stop sign. Right. And that by itself is um, a blind spot for cars coming in and somebody like me crossing the street with a stroller. Um, roundabouts, uh, I have concerns yes about... Yes no for roundabouts. Yes, <laughs> about <laughs> certain um, roundabouts in the city where I think um, emergency services might have a hard time reaching those alleys okay. and neighborhoods. Um, what do we do if it snows and we can't see certain edges right. of the roundabouts? Um, Something we haven't had to deal with to deal yet, with so far. But, but I'm just you know I'm, I'm I'm thinking ahead. Winter mm. is coming indeed. So um, I just want to ensure that when there are certain um, elements being introduced as far as road development, such as roundabouts, for instance, right. or, you know, the construction of um, stop signs, it is very important to take into account the opinions of the people who actually live right. in that neighborhood, because mm -hmm. that goes a long way in addressing your day-to-day 
because mm -hmm. you might not be walking those streets, but somebody else right. does. Yeah. So do you feel people that live in the neighborhoods are being given enough of a voice? Are they being heard when these concerns are raised? There is always scope to hear more mm -hmm. from people. If we as a city start thinking that we are hearing enough, right? then that doesn't bode well for development. Okay, well we, that's... We have to be constantly listening and there's always room to listen to more. Okay, that's... Um, okay, and then I guess one other thing we're talking about, um, if we just stay on sort of housing and development yes. for a little bit, are we doing enough for the more vulnerable folks in our community? Um, what do you think about social housing or supported housing? Does it belong in our neighborhoods or just what are your thoughts on that? Again, I'm, I'm not the expert on social housing. I will be very honest and say that I haven't had the opportunity to study mm -hmm. it in detail, especially right. um, where it fits in um, within certain cities or you know anything that goes along with it. But I, I do feel that as a city, if we start working with the most vulnerable of populations mm -hmm. right from the ground up, we are preventing um, what could be um, a situation that could go out of hand, like say downtown Vancouver, for instance, I go there to work every day and every day that I'm there, it just feels like the situation's getting worse and worse right. and worse. Um, and we're, we're fortunate to not have those issues um, in Port Coquitlam, but it's always best to preempt than have something come upon us that we are unable to control. So I, I want to say, there should be um, conversation mm -hmm. around social housing and okay. when there is, I will benefit from learning more about it. Okay. Yeah. Um, you use a term, I'm yeah. going to switch gears just yeah. a little bit, urban resilience. Yes. So can you explain to me a little bit more, what are you talking about when you say urban resilience? Um, resilience to me, first off, is something that, um, it's a word that I learned from my grandfather. Mm -hmm. And um, it is something that has resonated with me on a very core level. Being resilient means that you are able to outsmart your circumstances. Right. And um, you are able to beat the odds. And you may not necessarily emerge a winner, but you know how to deal with anything mm -hmm. that is thrown your way. That to me is resilience. And as a city, when we are talking development and we are talking progress, resilience has to come from the people. Right. And people, the most diverse of backgrounds, are almost always the most vulnerable of them as well. I, I just came across a very um, interesting statistic um, from the Canadian Women's Foundation that said, Diverse girls, especially young ones, age 9 to 16 years, are the most um, vulnerable to emotional disconnect, to mental health mm. issues, and to feeling a sense of um, dissonance from not only their family environment, but also their friends and community environment as well. Right. And that is the exact opposite of resilience, because you are then falling prey to your circumstances. So. A truly resilient city has the opportunity, or rather um, the tactics, to engage their most vulnerable community members in such a manner with the ones that are privileged to combat anything that could come their way. So May this, this be a pandemic? Exactly. And yeah. This kind of goes back to what you were saying yeah. earlier, right? So about that peer to peer yeah. kind of connection and the role that maybe the community center could be involved and the city could be involved in um, developing some of those kinds of programs. Yeah. One thing that I don't see in your platform um, that I think we should talk about a little bit is climate change. Right. It's not in my platform and that is very intentional. Mm -hmm because I feel um, that a lot of other council candidates and existing council members are doing their bit to um, talk about it and to um, make it a known issue. Okay. And for me, talking about climate change is also something that would be a part of my peer-to-peer -peer education right. model for newer families simply because 
Um, Nancy, when new families move to the community, they have a hard time navigating how to sort garbage as well. So if that basic knowledge is missing and we have the potential to talk to them about how to do that better, that leaves space open for bigger conversations. True, such it's as a starting climate change. Point. It's a starting yeah. point. Um, I believe instead of um, throwing issues and you know just trying to talk about everything mm -hmm. in my platform, I do right. want to keep drawing attention back to the fact that I am here to try and fill in the gaps for the council. No, I think that's a, a on good a very point. very that's, micro level. Yeah, yeah, that's a very valid point that you're focusing on um, things that you feel that you could excel at. Yeah. And when you say the city is doing enough for climate change, what are they doing? Like, what have you noticed um, that they're doing? What actions have we taken? Um, I know there's a lot of. Um, planning in place to make sure that if there are certain developments that are done um, as far as, in fact, I was just um, hearing out the last um, um, council meeting um, that they did where they were talking about making sure that, they, that a certain amount of trees within that neighborhood mm -hmm. um, were not put down unnecessarily for the sake of progress. So I know they're trying to tackle it in the best way that they can, mm -hmm. um, but they aren't. Um, I don't know if there are any big plans in place to exceptionally support climate change. Right. But to me, just addressing these small um, kind of bits and pieces where we aren't doing unnecessary damage to the environment, right. Um, you know, we're keeping our parks um, the way they're supposed to be, uh, but there's always space for more. We could have, um, you know, more green. Of course. Yeah. We and could. I'm interested in you saying that there was talk about keeping trees because yeah. we have, over the past several years, we've lost about 200 healthy, mature trees wow. in the downtown, just that small downtown core. Right. So if the conversation is starting to change, then yeah. that is really good news. Yeah. Um, and I would hope that it'll continue down that path. Yeah. Um, so one last thing that we always talk about is something that I think maybe you can bring a, a new perspective as well, is respectful workplace. When we have people on council, um, you know, there's differences of opinions and yeah. people are coming from all kinds of different perspectives, yeah. which is good. We need that diversity in opinions, but sometimes it can be, it can result in difficult situations as yeah. well. How do you see yourself fitting into that? Like what role would you play as city council to um, promote a respectful workplace with your peers? Um, to me, respectful workplace is, um, is something that stems out of listening mm -hmm. to people and honoring the person who is speaking by acknowledging that you may not necessarily agree with them, right. but you understand them. So just giving people the space to talk and engage in conversation, whether it is in agreement or in disagreement to me, right. is um, a great example of respectful um, workplaces. Uh, while we're on the conversation of respectful workplaces, I think representation mm -hmm. is crucial to having a respectful workplace because that is the only way you can be um, symbolic of the people that you're working for. When you say representation, you're talking about diversity yes. and in inclusivity? Yes, Okay. absolutely, yeah. yes. And I guess maybe just going down there just a little bit further, um, let's talk about reconciliation. So I think that's part of inclusivity yes. as well and, and respectfulness. Um, you know, with regards to government to government interactions. Do you think that we're doing enough to, um, you know, be moving forward with meaningful reconciliation? Do you think there's more the city could be doing? Nancy, I will always say when it comes to um, subjects such as these, the more we do will always be less because we're talking years and years and mm -hmm. years of damage done yes. to people, to populations, um, and whatever we do is never going to be enough. It needs to be a continuous effort because we could do something now, but are we able to keep that message relevant 
to my two-year-old daughter who will be 10 in a few years, who will be 15. So it needs to be continuous and that conversation and efforts constantly need to be right. made. No, yeah. that's a really good point, that yeah. it does need to be sustainable and carry on. Yeah. Where do you think we can start? What would be a good starting point to um, just to start moving forward with it? I think it needs to be continuous in everything that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. So more cultural awareness, more events instead of just maybe celebrating a few token days here right. and there. Having that conversation um, a part of everyday life, mm -hmm. maybe introducing food and art and yeah. textiles um, into right, the, um, whole culture, the whole the, cultural, cultural awareness exploration. And, and there mm -hmm. is, again, I want to draw back um, to the recreation center. It's such a great space. Yeah. Um, the gathering place, for instance, um, Lay Square, there is a lot that we could do within those spaces to give different cultures a voice Right. Every single day of the year. It doesn't have to be a few token days here and there. Okay, well, that's awesome, and, and thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. I'm getting the signal that our time is up. So I would like to thank you so much for coming in and, and letting us get to know you a little bit more and, and learning about your vision. So thank you so much for joining us. This is We've Got Issues, and we've just been talking to Mathila Karnak about running for Port Coquitlam City Council. Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much.